Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Church Solutions Podcast. My name is Phil Thompson. And I'm Steve Lacey. Steve, we'll introduce our guest here in just a moment. This is episode number 372. And Steve, we actually, uh, we're in Tucson, Arizona, but we actually had hail yesterday at my house and I think Michael's house. Did you get hail at your we house? We got hail yesterday, too. Yeah, so a little unusual for Tucson. It happens, but a little unusual. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, last time I was caught in hail, I had my new to me car and it started hailing and I was freaking out because I did not want hail damage on my brand new car. So yeah. brand new, new to me. So I was searching for cover, but yeah. this was yesterday was really small when before it was, it felt like they were rocks falling on top of the car. So uh yeah, when I pastored a church in Kansas, uh, hail was very common there. And one of the people in my church, actually, his job was he went around all over the tri-state area there uh, working on cars that were, had hail damage. So that's how he made his living with hail damage. Mm -hmm. And and I, some of the cars I saw, they looked like they were shot up, like little pellets and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, all right. So enough of this awkward uh uh, time of our conversation, which we do every week, we we find something awkward to uh, to talk about. Today we have uh, Angie Bauman, who is our guest today. Angie, uh, thank you for being with us. How are you today, Angie? I am well, and I didn't. I'm just learning that you guys are in Tucson. I have one of my very best friends lived in Tucson for years, and I, she took me out there a couple of years ago, and I fell in love with it. I'm taking oh. my boys back this summer, actually, so I love that that's where you are. Well, great. Well, well, you know, if you have an opportunity, you, we'll take you out for coffee or something. You know, I might yeah. take you up on that. We'll yeah, see how yeah. this goes. If you want to extend that invitation <laughs> or not, yeah, yeah, I'm delighted to be here, though. Thank you for having me. Yeah, normally. Uh, all right. Well, so let me just read Angie's bio here just uh, we got ahead of ourselves but Amy Angie is actually uh, a, a trauma and abuse survivor and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today it's a difficult subject but I think it's a very important subject and she she talks about this uh, uh, she lives in southern Illinois uh, what city are you in, in I'm in Carbondale okay all right home of Southern Illinois University go Salukis there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, her husband's name is Matt. She's got two sons, Alex and Josh. She is a licensed pastor. She's trained in leading inductive Bible studies through uh, Precept Ministries. She writes, she speaks, she teaches. Um, she is an author of two Bible studies, and she has a, a weekly podcast called Steady On. Uh, so check it out. And you do a lot of other things as well. So again, Angie, thanks for being with us today. We sure appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. All right. So uh, Steve usually will ask some questions, but I'll kick things off here. Uh, we're going to talk about <laughs> finding hope uh, today, about finding hope from abuse and trauma. That's that's the whole idea behind this podcast today. And uh, tell us, if you can, just briefly a little bit about your past and how God has been, been healing your heart on this whole issue. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up, I'm a PK. I grew up in a preacher's home, an itinerant. My father was an itinerant pastor in the United Methodist Church. And I say that, start off with that because we moved a lot uh, in the itinerant system. You're appointed for one, or at least in the United Methodist Church, you're appointed for one year at a time. And so, especially in my dad's early career, we moved every two to three years, which was pretty challenging for me as a young girl. I had a hard time now, looking back, I understand I had a large, a hard time not having roots. We didn't have close connections with extended family. I didn't stay in a school very long, just didn't have the opportunity to really what I would call put down some roots. And it, it made me feel, I think now that I look back on it, I had a, a feeling of maybe being invisible, of not being special, of not being honored of not being heard. Um, we didn't talk a lot about hard things in our family. We didn't talk very much at all about hard things in our family. And so I was just supposed to sort of adapt, you know, and keep going. And it's just dad's job and all of that. Um, when I was 16, uh, I was seduced and groomed into a romantic relationship with one of my high school teachers. He was the band director, very charismatic personality as predators often are. And I've learned looking back again, I keep saying that, but I, I've learned that a predator doesn't only groom his victim. And I say his, it's not always his, but in my situation it was, uh, but grooms the community or the organization in which they function uh, because they are trying to discredit uh, off the top, right? Discredit the victim 
should she come forward with her story, uh, which is exactly what happened. Um, the, the teacher that I was involved with had a long history of having special favorites, if you will. Um, he was not even very discreet about our relationship. The relationship went on for about nine months. He would come and get me out of class. He wrote letters, passed me things in the hallway, you know, all those kind of things. But he was beloved. The band in that school was something that sort of put that small community on the map. I hadn't been in that community very long. It was much easier for them to believe and support his story when the relationship became public than my story when I decided to come forward about truth. And in that small town of 1,400 people um, that most of them had deep roots, they had been there a long time, I felt very much disposable. The The community surrounded him with support. Uh, people wrote, wrote letters of support. They called me a homewrecker and a liar. And interesting, you know, because this podcast is so much about church and, and the way churches operate, it was really unfortunate for me too, that the, the church family that I had uh, was not supportive at all. And um, I felt very, very alone in that. Again, I was 16 and then turned 17 and um, it was it involved testifying at school board meetings. It involved the police. It involved the Department of Ch Children and Family Services. So it was a very traumatic event for me. But I, I know that really the abuse was bad, but the response to the abuse is what has created such lasting effects for me and why I still struggle with the situation some you know, I'm 47 years old, so 30 years later, and why it's still a, a big part of who I am and how it affects my relationships with people and also my relationship with God. Let me jump in here. I'm sorry, Steve. Let me jump in here. Let me ask you, you mentioned groom. He groomed the institution. Uh, I've heard the term grooming your victims. Just kind of, can you elaborate a little bit? At, can you clarify what, what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. So it's like um, you start with something small and then ask something bigger. So it started off as just noticing me and complimenting me on my music ability or on something I was wearing or on um, asking me if I was, I, I had uh, when, when it first started, I had been away sick with bronchitis for several days and he began to ask me how I was catching up in my classes. And then we began to have deeper conversations. And then he began to give me special privileges with the band and in, in, in front of the other students. And um, then he began passing me letters. And so each time that there was an extension of friendship or of connection, it became a little bit more intimate. It became a little bit more um, what is the word that I'm looking for? It invited me to do more, personal. to be closer to him, more personal. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so then you have this relationship and then there becomes sort of this secrecy about it, Phil, where we can't tell people we're staying after school because they wouldn't understand our relationship, right? We've, we've gotten so close and you understand me better than other people do. And we need to protect that because other people might object or they wouldn't understand. And so by the time you kind of are invited to, to help protect him or the relationship, uh, you know, you're pretty far in, at least I was. Okay. Wow. So you got to the point where you got the courage to come forth with this. How, how did you come to that decision? How'd you muster the courage? What, you know, what was the transition point? The transition point to, for me was the, the caseworker for the district, the department of children and family services actually found another girl who came to talk to me. She was quite a bit older than me. She was not old, but she was several years older than me at 16. A, quite, a few years is quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she was married and had a child at that point. And she brought me a yearbook that he had signed to her. And in that yearbook was a, a part of a poem that he had written, that he had written the same thing for me. And telling me that it was original, right? But it was like word for word, um, a poem of, of love and devotion that he had written in her yearbook. And when I saw that, I think it's just one of those things that the Holy Spirit begins to go. It just was like this tick, 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 tick of puzzle pieces, just sort of like in my heart, just fitting together and everything that I knew to be true and just between us and personal, then it just blew that open, Steve. And I realized that so much of what he had said to me 
was not about me at all, you know? And so at that point I did understand that there were others and I did understand that I had been lied to, uh, that he had misrepresented his devotion to me. And I had a younger sister and I thought of other girls, you know, in that mm-hmm. community. And quite honestly, I just thought, this is how, this is how you change something, which I think was one of the reasons it was so disappointed when I was, I was so disappointed and hurt when I wasn't believed because I kind of had this idea that, okay, I'll do the right thing. I will Mm -hmm. share the letters. I will tell my story. And then this will stop because people will, people will know what's really happening. It's just because they don't know that they haven't stopped it. And it was so hard and disappointing and hurtful and tragic and traumatizing all those things really when actually I did come forward and then my story was not believed. Did the, the woman that, that came to you, did she know or suspect what was going on? Why did she come to you to share what she did? The caseworker found her. I don't know how Mm -hmm. the caseworker found her and brought her to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know how, except for just the rumors, I'm sure through the years of other girls that had been uh, in the same situation I was in with him. Were your parents aware of any of this at one point? That's, that's a hard thing for me to understand. Still my parents, uh, part of the hurt has been that we don't talk about it. We never had, we really didn't at the time. My parents were aware Um, My grades were dropping. I broke up with the boyfriend that I'd had for a long time. I was lying, which was completely out of character. I would sneak out of the house. Sometimes I would misrepresent where I was, you know, so I was definitely um, doing some things that were not, you know, my normal behavior. Um, And so they were concerned. They had some talks with me, but they also felt like my relationship with him had positive things about it as well, especially early on. I had just, I wanted, I thought I wanted to be a nurse and then I decided to switch my major and go into music and all, like all of that was at his insistence or his encouragement, but they saw some positive things, which I think is so tricky about groomers and predators and abusers because people are not all good or bad and situations are never black or white. And so some of the reasons why my involvement with him was encouraging me and bringing me joy and some of those things, it was like, well, I don't want to get rid of that because of this concern. And maybe that concern, it's just me being suspicious or whatever. And so, uh, I, yes, they were aware, but they were not aware. I have to believe they were not aware of the damage. It was the, 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 the relationship in what it truly was. And in your mind, you're thinking at some point, like, okay, this is real. And as, as I get older, we're going to, we're going to be together. We're going to be. Yeah. I was 16. He was 39. He was married and had a son. So (laughs) there was a lot of complications around that, but you know, he promised me he was going to leave his wife and we would go away and be together. And so I was making plans thinking in my own mind, um, we're going to do, we're going to do music. It's going to be great. Um, he's, he's so unhappy in his marriage, you know, I mean, that's what he has had told me almost from the beginning. Um, and all of these, you know, all of these things, I was befriending his son. We spent some time together, um, just he and I, just because I felt like I was like, okay, I need to get to know this person if this is what's really happening. So yeah, I was, I had a completely twisted understanding of how this was going to play out. And you're, you're right. only 16. So I'm right. sorry, Steve. I keep, I, I keep saying no, Steve, you can ask questions, but then I jump in here. Go for it. Uh, but you're, you're, you're only 16. And and so I think you're just a, you're just a kid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So your yeah. expectations were you'd come forward and everybody would support you. And that was not the case. So big surprise, right? Is that how it transpired or? It, it was a big surprise. Um, once I understood that the support wasn't going to be there, I still was determined to come forward. I still testified and I shared the letters and did the things that needed to happen so that um, so that it would sort of be on record, if you will, for the school board. And then they had the decision whether or not to terminate him. Um, the Department of Children and Family Services did have what they call a founded report. I don't know uh, it in the state of Illinois, a founded report means yes, this did this did happen and it is proof and it is like 
um, I don't, it's not criminal necessarily, but it's um, the, the endangering of a minor. I'm, a, I'm above my head here in terms of my lingo, you know, but, yeah. um, and so that was a founded report. So the school board did have to deal with that and they did terminate him. Um, but there was a lot of uh, opposition to that and feeling like they shouldn't have done it. And it was in the newspapers, you know, the small rural town, it was in the newspapers right. all the time. It was on the radio shows. It was on the local news and um, you know, people, a lot of people were quiet and some people were very vocal. Um, and I do remember, you know, at the school board meeting, sitting alone until it was time to go into closed session to tell the next piece of my story or whatever, and um, walking the halls alone and kids putting notes in my locker, calling me vulgar things because I was, you know, because I dared to speak. And it was a social death from which I nearly did not recover, I will cool. say. Yeah. When I first went to college and tried to start my life over, I did it very alone, almost no contact with my parents. I didn't have, um, I didn't have any friends left because an abuser isolates, you know, and, um, the first couple of years after it were very, very dark. Yeah. I can see where, um, the you and from for our listener standpoint, they may say, oh well, then he was accused and it was over and and that was it, right? But that was definitely not it, right? It, it continued, it lingered on. So how have you um, <clears throat> addressed the healing? What's the healing? What's healing look like? Yeah, you know, it comes in layers. It's 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 very layered. It's a complicated, layered sort of thing, and the healing has come in layers as well. About twelve years ago, I was in a head-on car crash, and I was in. Uh, rehab for about nine months, cut recovering from injuries. And it was during that time, actually, that the Lord really invited me to look at how I was behaving and how I was trying to live around this situation in my life. I had become very work oriented, very productive oriented. I kept all the balls in the air and the plates spinning and all of that. And when I was in that crash and unable to do anything. I didn't serve the church that I was serving at the time. I couldn't take care of my children. My boys were six and seven months. I didn't take care of my home. I didn't take care of myself. I didn't walk. I didn't take my own shower. I did nothing, you know, and in that time of brokenness, the Lord really invited me uh, to look into my heart and I didn't want to at first. I did. I, it was so long ago, you know, even at that point, I'm like, that's so long ago. I don't want this to be about that. But the Lord really invited me to understand that it is still about that. But I have answers to that. And I was already a student of the word. I was already pastor, but I just felt, I guess, like I had this asterisk by my name and I knew his promises, but I wasn't really living by his promises. And, um, and it, it began to change things for me. And it's why I teach on the promises of God and how we know them and speak lies to the enemy with them. Because for me anyway, that's, it's a constant, it's, it's a constant to remember that I am who I, that he says I am, that he is who he says he is. And when those demons of distrusting people, feeling um, so sensitive to rejection, feeling like I'm disposable, those things that are still, you know, they, they're still common thoughts in my mind that the enemy would love to just, you know, um, camp and dance on, then these are the tools that I use to speak back to that. What, 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 uh, what, so if somebody listening to this podcast right now or watching it and they're, they're dealing with abuse, they, they are, you know, maybe a different context, mm -hmm. but maybe a, maybe a church situation might be a family situation. Uh, what, what would be the first three things that you would tell them? Yeah. Well, Two, for sure, come to mind. I'll say it that way. One, um, help is almost a necessity. And um, and so I think people need to be in some kind of counseling. And really, I would say two things at the same time. You need a trauma-informed counselor and you need a spiritual mentor of some sort. And, and that the two, it's hard to find it in the same person. I'll say it that way. Not impossible, but it's hard to find it in the same person. And can you work with some kind of spiritual mentor, or even if it's a, a trusted friend that loves the Lord, you know, and a trauma informed counselor together that, and that they appreciate, I don't, I don't, a lot of people will say, you've got to get into Christian counseling 
I'm not one that says that because most of my counseling that's been so helpful to me have been through people who weren't necessarily Christian counselors, but they deeply respected my faith walk and how God was a part of our, you know, sessions and our healing together. So I think that's important. Where do you get the help in the community? How do you say it out loud? A lot of times when we talk about our abuse the first time, it's not received by the person that we wanted it to be received by. That doesn't mean you're wrong. Find the person that you can share this story with who will believe and support you and keep trying until you find the right person. Um, and maybe that person is someone who can also help you get into counseling. But if you've not ever done that before, I really encourage someone who has maybe more biblical knowledge and someone who's trauma informed. And then the second thing is learn to study the Bible for yourself. Studies are great. Bible teachers are great. I would be a hypocrite if I didn't say I'm a Bible teacher. Uh, but how do you get into the word yourself and understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through the stories? And if you don't know where to start, start in the Gospels with Jesus and his interaction of women. Almost every woman in the Bible that Jesus has an interaction with has a story of sexual brokenness. Wow. Wow. I haven't thought about that, but that's, mm -hmm. wow, yeah. that's probably true. Yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. It, it seems like the trauma was in waves as well, right? I mean, it wasn't just the original abuse. It was the the follow-on of the you know, reaction to the community. And it's, I assume you you were thinking you were getting out of the initial trauma and you and that just initiated the, the additional trauma that's, is it more severe than the additional trauma or the initial trauma? What is it? For me, <clears throat> the response to the trauma has definitely had more lasting effects. Mm -hmm. um, I found it, I did not find it terribly difficult to forgive my abuser when the Lord began to open my heart to that part of the healing. Um, I ha I still find it very difficult to forgive the town, you know, the people, uh -huh. I, I don't know if you have the faces there. I don't even have the names there. Um, but when I struggle in my lack of forgiveness, it is, it is to the people who saw and said nothing. That's hard for me still. I do not deny that. Yeah. Uh, triggers. Yes. Talk a little bit about triggers. Do, do you still yeah. have, what are triggers and do you still experience them? Absolutely. I still experience them. I've learned to talk to them. And that's one of the things that I try to teach sometimes, because I think we all experience them. Most of us have had some kind of trauma or deep wounding at some, uh, you know, at some time. And a trigger is really just a small thing that creates a, a large thing. My older son played high school basketball for four years. And when I was in school, the pep band and high school basketball games was a big part of my life in school. And I always played at the bed at the pep games, sometimes direct directed at the, uh, at the, at the ball games, you know, the pep band and stuff. And it's so crazy because 25 years later, plus when Alex, my older was in high school, I'm like, how are there not new songs? There's no, <laughs> they're not new songs. And I wanted so much to enjoy and support and be able to watch my older son. And we would go into that gym and the band would get set up and they would start tuning up. And I could feel like I could feel this sort of flight or fight response in myself or my breathing wasn't as calm. I could feel the tears stinging my eyes. I could feel, I felt very small. I felt like people were looking at me. This is an, an, an appropriate reaction, if you will, like a natural reaction to the pep band warming up. And yet it would happen time after time. That kind of thing is a trigger, right? Because it's just, it's reminding you of something that you felt a long time ago. But what I would, what I would find in myself is I was not experiencing joy, watching my son play basketball, which he worked so hard at and wanted his mother there to support him. I would get angry at my younger son if he wasn't behaving the way that I thought he would in a, in a too sharp of a manner. I would snap at my husband for something that wasn't his fault because the popcorn was too salty. But really what all this was about, right, was the fact that I was just on edge. And so that's the kind of thing that a trigger does. And that's just one example. But my husband and I developed this thing where often he would look at me. I began to talk about it and share what was happening to me and my husband. And we still do this. We, he would look at me and say, there's a band. And you know what that did to me was just acknowledge that I see you. I know this is hard for you. I'm here with you. Um, remember what you know. Let's enjoy this game with Alex and you know, and take a break if you need to. So that's kind of a long answer to what a trigger is. But yeah, I talk about five R's. I don't know. You want me to do that now that I yeah. use? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, let's do that. 
I use five R's um, that are kind of like steps to help help me talk to my triggers. And they're all, um, I have a scripture linked to them. So step one is to recognize. And the question I ask myself is when anxiety rises, what does my body do? Um, that's based on first Peter five, seven and eight, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So what does the anxiety feel like um, for me? Like I was just saying, it felt like I was angry inside. I felt like um, I felt shameful. You ever, I don't know if you guys do that, but you, sometimes something will happen. And I just kind of feel this heat wash of shame over me. Um, a lot of times, whatever that thing happened, that that's triggered me to go back to that place of people aren't going to believe you. They don't, they don't love you. They don't support you and you are disposable. And so what, it, what's happening, uh, what physical thing is happening or what mental thing is happening that lets you know that you've been triggered. Step two is reveal. The question is, what am I believing on the inside about what's happening on the outside? John one, five says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It's very brave to ask yourself, is this really about the salty popcorn or is this really about what happened to me when I was 16? <laughs> and that's that question, right? Like, is this really about that? And if it is about that, then what do I do about it? Because I don't want to react to my family or to this experience from that place of that wounded 16 year old. I want to do it from the place of this confident God loves me. And I know that 47 year old, right? Um, and so step two is to reveal what am I believing or feeling on the inside about what's happening on the outside? Then step three is remember. The question is, where have I experienced God's faithfulness in previous circumstances? Psalm 145, 13 says, the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. This has been huge for me because as I experience a trigger or as I start going to that place where I've been so many times before and doubting myself or believing the lies, doubting God's love for me, remembering how it felt uh, when people didn't believe me, instead I can remember the times when God has shown up. I can remember even when I was 16, the ways that God helped me through that struggle. I can remember the different places that he has revealed his faithfulness. And then I can choose to trust that he is faithful today, that he is faithful in this, that he sees me, um, that he is always for me, that he is always good. Step four is to receive. How is God revealing his presence in this experience? John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. That Greek word for troubled means like a stirring, like um, like the sediment, you know, at the bottom of a creek or something when the creek is clear and it seems like it's going fine, but something stirs that sediment. And then all of a sudden it's like breaking up and it becomes what was clear becomes muddy. And Jesus is saying, you know, when your heart is like that, have my peace. The Greek word for peace means to join, right? Join with me. And so will you receive from me the peace, the rest, the hope, the love that I am offering you in this moment, because, you know, I think this can be the most difficult part. Sometimes will we humble ourselves and say, I will receive what you have for me instead of trying to control this narrative on my own. And then step five is repeat. How do I offer myself grace with this process? Cause it's not a one and done <laughs> lamentations three 22 and 23 says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I often like to replace that they are new every morning that with they are new every moment when we need them mm -hmm. to be, because sometimes we're just in a hard place and everything feels like it hurts. I did when we moved my older son to college last year and he was right in that season of life. That was the most difficult, dark time for me. I felt like everything was triggering me. I was so in touch with that 17 year old you know, version of myself. And I just really realized that this is a this is just a season of time where it feels like it's coming from everywhere, but I know better now. Um, his experience is not my experience and I'm not that girl now. And, um, and so I just kind of went through these often um, in that season because it just was a, it was a more challenging time than some others are. So we're, we're running out of time here and that that's really good, Angie. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Um, from your experience, now you work with survivors, trauma survivors, uh, both within the church and without the church, right? I mean, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to say this delicately, but uh, it's the same. It it happens in church. Absolutely. When I say in church, I'm I'm talking about the the environment, not necessarily in the building, but the environment and Christian homes. I mean, trauma happens, especially sexual abuse. I mean, it happens everywhere. I mean, the church is not immune to it, right? 
Well, no. And quite honestly, I think the church is more vulnerable to it a lot of times because we elevate this, this man, I'm going to say man again, in power, this person of power, and we want to protect what he or she has helped us build, which is the same reason for like in my circumstance, it's not different at all. He had built a band that the the town loved and there was a lot of joy that came and there was a lot of good that came and students were learning and they were excelling and there was something to protect there right. and that's mm-hmm. the same in our churches right there's a there's a pastor or a a young uh, a young life ministry leader or a youth pastor or you know there's something and they have created something that we want to hang on to and so we have a hard time believing this about them or wanting to move forward with saying what we know is true about them because we don't want it to damage something mm-hmm. that we it'll cost us something if it goes away that's that's yeah. that's well said yeah okay so uh somebody's listening to this podcast and, and they they want more help or they need some information how can they reach out to you yeah, the website is a great place. And there's a download for this Talk to Your Triggers. All those uh, triggers and scriptures yeah. and steps and all that are on there too. But it's livesteadyon.com. And you can pretty much find all kinds of things, uh, yeah. everything you need there. Live steady, livesteadyon.com. Com. Yep. Okay. All right. Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Angie Bauman has been our guest today on the Church Solutions Podcast, a, a topic that I think we talked years ago about spiritual abuse and we had actually a lot of response but it's 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 a delicate topic and it's i know it's hard to talk about uh, for some people but we appreciate you being on our podcast today angie it is my delight it really is thank you for having me all right good deal okay well we're out of time here and again folks reach out to angie if you need if you missed all that stuff you can always send us an email support at streamingchurch.tv we're a tech company but we're more than a tech company we we we, we work with churches and ministries. We've all had experiences, which is why we have different topics like this one here, which I think is a very important topic. There really is hope, right, Angie? There's hope for people that have gone through trauma. Absolutely, there is hope. Yeah, so there's hope for you if you've gone through that. All right. Okay, well, look, we're out of time. We sure appreciate you, Angie. And uh, Steve, thank you for your input today. I'm uh, glad to be here. And my and name thank is Thank you, Phil. Angie. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you folks for listening or watching to the, uh, watching this podcast, the church solutions podcast, please subscribe to us. And again, if we can help you, if anything, reach out to us, uh, have yourself a great day, take care of yourselves and each other. And uh, we'll catch you again next time on another episode of the church solutions podcast.